interesting. I have the um, pleasure of uh, introducing Suzanne Mulschlegel. Uh, she's joining us from the University of Massachusetts. She's a full professor and the uh, interim division chief of neurocritical care. She received her medical degree in Germany and then came to the University of Florida for internal medicine internship and neurology residency. She then completed a fellowship in neurocritical care and vascular neurology at the MGH in Brigham. And uh, interestingly, while junior faculty at uh, UMass, she also obtained her MPH in clinical effectiveness at the Harvard School of Public Health. She has a very special interest in mentoring trainees and junior faculty, and she's the director of the Junior Faculty Development Program at UMass. Um, and she's also the director of neurocritical care research. And um, she focuses the majority of her research on moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. And what I think is really kind of groundbreaking about her research is the work that she'll talk to us about today, which is on developing communication and decision support tools with new technologies to sort of help improve decision-making for families um, in patients with acute brain injury. Um, and surprisingly, she's received NIH funding for her work. And when you go on the NIH website and try to find similar projects, there aren't very many. And so I think this is really interesting stuff that she's going to be talking to us today and, and really important. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure uh, to be here today. Uh, so I was asked to not only talk about the shared decision-making stuff, but also about neuroprognostication. The two kind of go hand in hand, but half of my talk will be on, on that other stuff. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay with you guys. I um, hope you can see this. Let's see, is this full slides? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, I'm at UMass Chan uh, Medical School uh, in central Massachusetts. I live outside of Boston, uh, and this is about a 40 minute drive out uh, with a very diverse uh, patient population. I have to show my funding. I also have received some speaker honoraria from the American Academy of Neurology, but none of that has any conflict. I won't be discussing off-label drugs. Uh, so hopefully I think we're okay from a CME standpoint. Um, so three things really I want to uh, touch base on today. Uh, number one is what decisions are we really talking about? And I know this is a ICU uh, audience, uh, so I can go relatively fast on that because you know it, but I will point out a few things that are specific to neuro. And then the science behind prognosis and prognostication, because that's what we're asked to do. And then, of course, talk about shared decision making as one a proposed solution to some of the issues. So when you'll hear me talk today about severe acute brain injury or SABI, I don't just mean traumatic brain injury. Yes, that's part of it, but I also mean these large ischemic strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, and in some diseases, you may even add hypoxic brain injury uh, to that. And when I mention the goals of care decision, I don't just mean the trach and peg decision, that's part of it. I mean the whole package deal of what happens uh, afterwards, uh, the post-ICU care, uh, and everything else that follows. So that's just for definition. All right, so in, in neuro, uh, but in, in, in general, every ICU, our patients are incapacitated, right? They're either sedated or comatose, really, really sick. And if you add a brain injury uh, on top of that, it might leave them without decision-making capacity for a while, sometimes weeks, months, maybe even life. And the first thing that families will ask you once they're stable is what's next? What does this mean? What's the prognosis? How about all the other things? Uh, and so uh, that's what we as intensivists face on a regular basis. I will say the key to all of this are two things. Once, what's the prognosis? Uh, or you will hear me explain in a moment why from here on, I will move to the term prognostication and really what are patient values and preferences? I think those are the key things. There's three questions. Usually uh, what families ask or what we ask ourselves is, will he or she awaken and when? Will he or she be okay when that happens? And what does okay really mean? What's really a good outcome and to whom and when and what does it take to get there? Uh, so those are that's kind of our baseline where we all come from. There's really two groups that are involved in this. One that's us, the clinical team, uh, the triage we have to make, who and what to mobilize, what procedures we might offer or not, 
and how to communicate to the family. And I will add not just how, but when and what. And then the family has to take on the surrogate decision-making role. And as we all know, they're not prepared for that many, many times. Uh, and then they have to ask themselves these really life or death decisions, including what would the patient want and what's the right decision for that one patient. And one thing that families face a lot and that we as physicians often, often ignore, don't know enough about are the financial decisions uh, that families have to make as well. So ideally, this is what it should look like, right? We should combine the evidence and preference-based medicine. What does that mean? So the evidence is, what's the prognosis? What are some of our intervention effects? So the really clinical stuff. The preference is really what a patient values and preferences. Are there maybe advanced directives that we can lean on? And then ask the clinical expertise that can synthesize uh, all of that. But I will tell you, and you all know this, it sounds really idealistic, but uh, in reality, it can be really difficult. And it's actually rarely achieved uh, in a balanced and good way. So I will introduce now the fact that we should probably say prognosticate and not prognosis uh, when we talk to families. Um, because prognosis, the Greek word comes from pro before gnosis, knowing knowing beforehand, I would say in clinical medicine, we don't know. And if someone claims they know for sure, I would actually doubt uh, their uh, prognosis or prognostication. And I will show you later that families also will doubt you. So we what, what we really should do is prognosticate, which is the foretelling of the future from signs or symptoms. Uh, and the one thing you need to know here is that in prognosis, it indicates knowledge. And again, we rarely actually have true knowledge of what will happen in the future, while prognostication really indicates probabilities. Uh, and let me show you what I mean by that. So unless a patient is brain dead, um, all we can do is prognosticate, meaning providing the family a probability of an outcome. So here's an example of what's called an icon array. And there are many people who are a lot smarter than uh, me and any of us who do risk communication research, and that's all they do. And they've essentially shown that when we show a picture uh, that shows you know, 100 people and not just dots or, or figures, but actual figures that look like humans, that uh, lay people tend to understand numbers uh, the best. Uh, and so here's an example of an icon array where we used a model, uh, not the ICH model, the original one, which has been shown to be somewhat nihilistic, but the 12 month validated outcome uh, of someone, I'll show you the clinical characteristics here, but it doesn't really matter. But what I'm trying to tell you is how do we know that the patient will be down here dead versus one of the blue figures here that live uh, and survive, but with moderate severe disability where they are unable to walk, but need others to help them versus here that they will live and be able to walk without help and may just need a little bit of help or no help at all. And so all we can do in clinical practice really is provide uh, the best possible prognostication. Uh, and I'll dive into that a bit more. One thing to know, there's no guidelines, right? How can we be guided in something? We refer to guidelines all the time in our clinical uh, practice, but for this, we really don't. And there's no real good standardized way uh, to approach this. So when you look at what goes into this, there might be a scale, but some people don't like scales. There might be comorbid conditions, ICU complications in the trajectory. We all know that early D9, D and R um, may be associated with worse outcomes. And then this vague thing, the provider hunch and experience, uh, and maybe a bunch of other things, right? Uh, and so what I'm trying to tell you here is really unclear. I hear this all the time. And when you read articles about neuroprognostication, you often hear that it supposedly is an art. Uh, and you can tell by my language that I don't agree with that term. Why? Because look at this. So art to me is that how I might interpret this picture, for example, is very different than what, let's say, Alex might interpret this picture as. And in art, you are free to interpret in whichever way you would like to. Uh, and I'm showing you here some example papers that this hasn't changed at all over decades. 
What I will ask is, should neuroprognostication really be an art? Think about the stakes. Uh, these are high stake decisions. I will argue, no, it should not be an art, that we should have some way to at least try to ground ourselves and trying to have a somewhat better systematic approach to this. Let me tell you what can happen when we look at this as an art. So this is a landmark paper from Alexis Turgeon, who holds the Canadian Research Chair in Severe TBI, and he's published a lot on this. And this is a paper where he chose six level one uh, trauma centers in Canada. He asks uh, his co-investigators to choose 120 random patients and then they recorded how many of them died from withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. And this is already the adjusted odds of dying from life-sustaining, uh, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies adjusted for known predictors of mortality and TBI uh, listed down on the bottom, but look at the variability. So in some centers, you have more than double the odds of dying from withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies in other centers, less than half. Why is that? The other thing that Alexi noted in his study is that two thirds of this decision was done in the first three days after admission, in the first 72 hours, so quite early. Uh, and I will, I will wonder, is it really possible to know uh, what will happen in the future? And if you believe this is just for TBI, well, let me tell you, this also happens in the same variability seen after cardiac arrest. Won't go into detail of the study, but you can see it's similar. Uh, and in ICH, uh, this is not a true patient-based study, but a clinical vignette study where physicians were asked how they would prognosticate, but essentially the same variability has been seen. Uh, so it doesn't matter what disease we deal with. This is a problem uh, for specific for neurocritical care. I will also wonder why that exists. And there are other studies that I'm not showing today, but when you adjust for patient-based uh, pr predictors or family-based predictors or religiosity or geography or whatever else you want to adjust for, this variability doesn't go away. And so it makes you wonder if maybe it's us, the doctors and providers who might bring bias to the picture and maybe even use heuristics uh, to provide prognostication. So what does heuristics mean? It's a very interesting phenomenon, uh, but in psychology, it, it's known to be um, a way that all of us uh, humans generate solutions to complex problems by simplifying assumptions and uh, recognizing patterns. Here's an example. Let's say I'm rounding, I'm rushed, uh, because so much is going on. I might be very distracted because a patient was crashing. Now I'm trying to redirect my attention to rounds and finish this up. And the resident uh, presents, this is an 80 year old patient found down with uh, an hemorrhage. And in my head, immediately I'm thinking, oh, that's bad. It can only be bad. I don't even need to hear anything more. This is bad. And then you have to slow yourself down because that is heuristics. You're simplifying your assumption. You don't even know much about the case. You're trying to use pattern recognition uh, and that is where bias has come from, right? So if this is poorly calibrated, we make bad decisions. There's also this term of system one, system two processes and decision-making. System one is fast, automated and using heuristics versus the system two is slow, deliberate and analytic. Again, if we're poorly calibrated and you're leaning more towards this fast automated version, you're going to use heuristics and introduce bias and simplify things that probably shouldn't be simplified. And so this is where some of that problem might lie. Now, there's no existing studies yet in neurocritical care, but there are very interesting simulation studies in serious illness uh, uh, in, in elderly people that I'm happy to share. Amber Bonato has done a lot of that work but it's very, very intriguing. So how should we go about this, right? Let's, do, let's break this down, the prognostication to two processes. One, one is the formulation of the prognosis. That's not really well understood. I'll show you one really great paper that recently came out, uh, but this is also where biases and heuristics might come in versus the communication of the prognosis, right? So I'll show you today some data that we know from Gen ICU, some of the stuff we've done in the neuro ICU, uh, and then we'll dive into 
uh, maybe a shared decision making to make things better. So here's a small study of my colleague, David Wang, uh, where he involved five US centers. Uh, and he this was a prospective study of ICH where he asked the uh, attending and the bedside nurse within the first 24 hours of admission to make a prognostication about what the patient would look like at three months. They were not allowed to use a scale and these centers don't use scales routinely. And so this is literally just what the provider thought. And I'll show you the results of that in a moment, but what a, a sub-study of that was asking physicians what they use to come up with their prognosis. And here's what's been used. So a potpourri of things, many things, some people use two, some people use uh, everything. And there's again, no rhyme or reason uh, and no real systematic approach to this when you look at this in aggregate. This is a cool study that was recently published in Resuscitation by the Pittsburgh group around Jonathan Elmer and Alexis Steinberg was part of this. Uh, they used a, an approach called uh, mental modeling. So what they did is they conducted um, semi-structured interviews in 36 physicians. You can see here the breakdown, some from Europe, some from North America. Uh, and they asked, and this is specific for cardiac arrest, how they come up with prognosis in cardiac arrest with their prognostication. Essentially what they found is that the process is influenced by factors that are really considered in research and guidelines. So what is meant by that? So here in this picture from the paper, uh, the thickness of the arrow indicates how often it was mentioned. So when you, there's three processes, essentially the acquisition, the interpretation, then the formulation, of the prognostication. So in the acquire phase, uh, you can see that the thickest error is hospital factors. You know, not the things that the A and guidelines tell us we should acquire necessarily, but a lot of the times it's dependent on what time, the hospital, whether the MRI might've been available and all sorts of stuff. And then the interpretation, I would say probably most commonly were test features, but then look at the formulation of the prognostication. Again, hospital factors, physician factors. So some things that we don't usually consider are part of a guideline, are part of this and are maybe influencing how physicians prognosticate in a much better way. So this is a complex way of symbolizing that there are other things that go into prognostication that are often ignored. And guess what? Also not taught in medical school, but they influence how doctors prognosticate and thereby may influence patient outcomes. We conducted a small study in TBI experts where we asked uh, physicians from 20, from seven centers. Uh, these were nurse surgeons or intensivists, uh, some other people. Uh, what do you do and how do you uh, predict outcomes and what do you do? do you use a prediction model? So we, could, we were specifically, specifically interested in the impact model because that's the most widely validated one. And interestingly, so several physicians felt that this is a very heterogeneous disease and it's a good thing that we have something that could ground physicians, especially those with little experience. Of course, there were others that say, well, this is for research now, you shouldn't use this on individual patients. Some mistrusted the data from which the model was derived. And some actually believed that if you gave numbers to families that you could mislead them. And I will show you in a moment what families really need, and that is probably an incorrect uh, assumption. But again, some did feel that this helps ground physicians. This is the study I just mentioned by David Wang, where he asked phys uh, physicians and nurses, what's the outcome at three months in these ICH patients? And what I'm showing you here is the main finding of the study. On the y-axis here, the correlation coefficient, the higher, the better the correlation with actual outcome at three months. And look, attendings and nurses had the highest correlation with actual outcome. Well, when you look at these two very well you know, validated scores that are often mentioned, and guess what? JCO actually wants you to put in an admission note for an ICH patient actually don't do very well compared to actual outcomes. Now, this study was heavily criticized saying, well, if you're asking physicians that are actually involved in the clinical care, of course they may, you know, then uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, advise towards continuation or withdrawal of care. This is the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so they actually did a sensitivity analysis where they excluded 
patients that had withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. And guess what? The attendings of nurses still were better. So they still had the same findings. So I think there's a pretty convincing thing that maybe scores alone aren't what we should be doing. I just mentioned this term self-fulfilling prophecy. In my opinion, that's still the largest problem that prevents us from having better outcomes in really any patient in the neuro ICU. So this was first mentioned and kind of became uh, a term after Kira Becker uh, published her landmark paper in 2001, now 21 years ago, believe it or not. Uh, we replicated this in TBI with the same approach that Kira did and found the same thing. Uh, and if you want to walk away today and go home and read one paper, uh, I really can highly recommend this paper here, Clinical Nihilism and Neuroemergencies by Doug White and Claude Hempel, both of whom are uh, really published a lot on this. And it's really drums home the issue that we as physicians may actually play a huge role uh, in this variability uh, of, of, of life, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. So I wanna show you some examples in TBI at least of what might happen if you actually let people live. Uh, and so here is a study from last year uh, that created a lot of waves in the field from JAMA Neurology, uh, the track TBI outcome at 12 month study. I'm only showing you severe TBI. They also showed moderate in their paper, but I won't uh, show you that because it's exactly the same. Uh, this is 18 level one trauma centers, a prospective observational study uh, in the uh, mid 20 teens. Uh, this is severe only, so 362 patients. And you can see here the, uh, uh, the GOSC um, at two weeks, three months, six months, and 12 months. And you can see here this dark bar, the dead, you can see that the majority of those who die, die in the first two weeks, right? Because this this, gra this bar doesn't grow that much over the 12 month period. So a third of the deaths actually occurred in the first three days, similar to what Alexis Toujon published, uh, half of them within the first two weeks and nearly two quarters of all deaths occurred by two weeks. Um, but what you can also see that if you let people live, that these, these bars of pretty good outcomes, so GOS of greater than four, grew steadily, uh, especially you know three months, even all the way up to 12 months. And so uh, we should also note that uh, one in five patients had zero disability. Uh, and these are all severe TBI, meaning their GCS was really low in admission. So uh, I think this reminds us that we should really think hard before we perform withdrawal of life sustaining therapy. Now, I will say, of course, I'm not promoting to continue care on patients with fixed and dilated pupils in a devastating scan. Absolutely not. But we all, and actually probably more, more commonly, see these in-between cases that look kind of bad, but they're, they're you know, they're, Head CT looks like they could survive, but they're still in the coma. And, and those are the people uh, that I'm talking about. Here's a study that showed that up to 15% of the severe TBI may start following commands after two weeks after injury. And again, remember that two weeks seems to be kind of this threshold of where uh, a lot of families are asked to make a goals of care decision or then kind of thinking about withdrawal of life sustaining therapies or even being suggested to think about that. But keep in mind that, you know, people may wake up uh, later. This is a study um, of the placebo arm of the Imantidine and Serial TBI trial. For those of you who are not familiar with this trial, uh, this was a um, RCT published in the Ring and Journal showing that Imantidine will shorten the time to awakening after severe TBI. It's become kind of standard of care. Uh, if, so in the placebo arm, what this uh, is showing that when they were admitted to rehab, right, most weren't doing any of these behavioral uh, commands. But then at six weeks, so only six weeks later, this is without demantidine. Look how many have regained the ability to do these things, such as attention, intelligible speech, object recognition, all of those things. And this graph is really only to show, again, the same thing on admission, 90% did nothing, 10% did one thing. And then six weeks later, a, a large proportion, 20% did all six things. Uh, and so uh, we should really keep that in mind to give people potentially time. This is hot off the press. I got this, this is a poster from the 
recent Nurgle Care Society meeting uh, in Texas in October, uh, also from Track TBI a propensity score analysis where they compared or matched by propensity score. Those, uh, these are all patients admitted to the ICU with severe TBI, moderate severe TBI, uh, and they compared those who had care withdrawn versus those who didn't have care withdrawn and matched them based on the propensity and other characteristics. And I'll go through this quickly, but this again shows that most, the tier four, the ones with a very high likelihood to have care withdrawn, this happens the first week. Look at this. And those who had like a middle uh, propensity score of care withdrawn also did it most, most of them happened in the first two weeks. So this over and over and over again, that you, you, you hear that this happens very, very early. And what they did is they then matched people who had care withdrawn versus those who didn't have care withdrawn based on clinical characteristics. And were able to show that if you give people time uh, three months, six months, and 12 months, that there was a proportion of patients that actually did fairly well and were living at home, right? So which is something that people care about a lot. And so that really kind of should resonate. Maybe we need to think about this early withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy a little bit. Um, and then finally, we, as a, a reminder that we should really look at our own biases and avoid nihilism, especially early on. This is a, this is a blog where the authors of the um, rescue ICP trial, so a large randomized controlled trial, craniectomy uh, for ICP control that showed that more people would survive uh, and that there at 12 months, there's actually improved outcome. That data was just published. Uh, and, and, and the authors really remind everyone that it's not us for clinicians to unilaterally decide uh, whether a given degree of disability is acceptable, right? It's the person who has to accept that outcome is the patient. And of course, the family as their spokespeople. And I don't know about you, but I have several colleagues, unfortunately, that sometimes say, oh, this is terrible. Their outcome will be terrible. Well, who are you to judge that, right? Maybe an acceptable outcome might be different for the patient than what might be acceptable to you. Uh, and they also remind us that maybe shared decision-making can play a final rental role. Now, I'll show you more on that. So before we go there, I'd like to tell a bit more about how ICU physicians communicate prognostication and how surrogates understand it. Some data from the gen ICU, not neuro, uh, but then translating it to neuro as well. So a lot of this work's been done by Doug White, who's now at Pittsburgh. Um, a lot of qualitative work. So here is a study that where he audio recorded uh, family meetings uh, in several ICUs, um, and they were about life support decisions or goals of care decisions. And he, uh, by listening to these conferences, so felt that there were four roles that physicians might play. So in some conferences, there was this directive role that he defined as no deliberation, minimal information, just really deciding for the family almost independently, looking at the numbers, thankfully that happened rarely, but it did happen. Informative is almost the opposite where you flood the family with medical information, but there's no deliberation over goals of care or over values and preferences or even any recommendations made. And then there's the facilitative role where first there's medical information, Values and preference are elicited, then you summarize and you help the family uh, come to a decision. Uh, and then collaborative, where uh, a recommendation is made with permission uh, of the family. And so um, we, um, I'll, I'll skip this, we replicated the study uh, in the neuro ICU. We I pooled the recordings that I just showed you, uh, but used only patients. Uh, that had a primary neurologic di uh, diagnosis. That was about 20 or so from this other study from Doug White. And then we used our own audio recordings. So this is a study that is ongoing in our ICU where we audio record uh, family meetings uh, and did a similar approach. We called them a little bit differently because it didn't quite fit, but we called this authoritative where it's literally just telling the family what to do. There's no good medical information, no deliberation, and certainly no values and preferences elicited. Uh, we called it informational, where there was info only, but no values and preferences uh, elicited. Advisory, where first there was a prognosis, then values and preferences elicited, and then maybe a little bit of advising on what to do. 
versus responsive where the prognostication was adjusted after hearing the vows uh, and preferences. And so um, as you can see here, the two blue versions, the authoritative and informational are the versions where no vows and preferences were elicited. And we found that in 44%. Now I will say that the recordings from the other study from the other centers were a little bit older than what we're doing currently. And maybe things and how we talk to families has changed uh, a little bit in the meantime. And we were also able to find, this is a early uh, analysis, but we were also able to find that when we look at break it down by neurointensivist versus non-neurointensivist, that neurointensivists were more likely to kind of take in this advisory role. But you can see even there, sometimes an authoritative role was taken, uh, while the non-neurointensivists more often used the authoritative or informative role. So very early, but you know, somewhat interesting uh, data that there are differences. Back to the general ICU, same study where they then analyzed the actual language that physicians use for prognostication. Uh, and um, they broke it down by types of statements. So qualitative probability statements were the most common. It is very likely he won't survive. Um, then there were numeric statements in one and five. So one example might be 50% of people as sick as your father don't survive. Absolute statements such as he will not survive are also present. Uh, and then these what's called non-probabilistic statements in 40%. So somewhat vague in terms of survival, things don't look good. Uh, and, uh, and so um, you can also see by the numbers that in one meeting, different types of language uh, may have been used. And interestingly, um, rarely did doctors even ask whether families wanted to hear a prognostication, which is interesting, right? You kind of assume they do, but maybe they don't always want to. But also, you're supposed to always check, did they understand it? Can you say it back to me? And that happened very rarely. So we uh, did a similar analysis, again, in our co pool cohort uh, of audio recorded family meetings and SABI patients. Uh, this is currently under review uh, at a journal, uh, but what we we're able to, I can't show you everything because it's under review, but what I what I am showing you here is that not only did we see differences in non-probabilistic and probabilistic statements, but also it depended on what outcome was discussed. And so you can see here in blue, cognitive looked very different than physical or survival. And survival, which wasn't very commonly uh, addressed to begin with. So in neuro, everyone cares about their cognitive and physical outcomes. So um, that's under review, hopefully out soon. So why is that, that doctors rarely communicate in quantitative terms? So there's a lot of literature about this, but the, this is the summary of it, is that usually there's poor or no training on prognostic communication, but also you have to come up with a number somehow, right? So there's the reluctance of doctors to predict the future and, and the, the, that they're uncertain about their own prognostic uh, estimates, right? So I will show you now what surrogates would like to hear, and maybe it'll help you adjust the way you talk to families. So we uh, did a qualitative study a few years ago now where we asked stakeholders, so surrogate decision makers of uh, previous or current moderate severe TBI patients, what do you need from physicians when they talk to you about prognostication? And the majority of surrogates preferred having exact estimates. Uh, and I'm showing you here a quote from that. Uh, we were a little surprised by that ourselves, and they were very unsatisfied with hearing things like highly likely or unlikely. But contradictory to that, the majority of physicians say they typically and on purpose omit uh, these uh, numeric predictions for two reasons. A, they felt that A, there's not enough accuracy in the existing models. Again, this is specific to TBI but most importantly for the fear of creating false hope. Uh, and again, for early, I showed you that the fear of uh, misleading families uh, potentially. So what, that, what our study really showed is that what families need is not what physicians currently practice. So um, it, this is again, Doug White's work uh, in the audio record. No, so this is not audio recording. This is semi-structured interview of uh, surrogate 
uh, of critically ill patients at three hospitals where they really asked, how much do you trust uh, the physician's prognosis? And guess what? The majority, 88%, almost 90% had doubt, which is huge, right? So why do they doubt? Well, there's a small proportion that believe that it's God, that only God can alter the course of the illness. But most of them say, well, we know there is uncertainty. Uh, and if the doctor predicts with a lot of certainty that that then creates doubt. Uh, they've also had prior experiences with doctors wrong predictions. And most importantly, most common was that they've already had experiences during that one hospital stay where there were contradicting prognostications provided by different teams or different doctors and disagreements which I think we've probably all experienced as well. And that creates a lot of doubt uh, among surrogates. But interestingly though, no matter how much doubt they had, they all wanted to hear what the doctor had to say. So they wanted to hear the estimates even when the prognosis was poor. Here's a recent study from uh, Claire Kreutzfeld and her group uh, at UW uh, where they asked uh, families of patients with severe acute brain injury uh, three questions within the first week of uh, hospital stay. Um, and I will add, I think this is a weakness of the study, uh, is that this was completely unrelated to any family meeting. So they didn't even record whether and if and when maybe a meeting with a physician may have happened. So we don't know if the numbers I'm going to be showing you is after a prognostication with the physician or before or a mix of it. So the, the numbers may look very different if you systematically assess this after a, a family meeting, but they were asked, what do you think your loved one's chances of recovering to the point of independence six months from now, right? Uh, if you had to guess what, it's, what does the doctor think and what do you think explains the difference? And they asked the physician similar questions. And so it's a little bit complicated. So I'll explain the terms to you. So they define prognostic discordance as 20% or more difference between the family and the clinician prediction, right? So that's pretty easy. They also looked at misunderstanding where there had to be a 20% or more difference between the physician and family's estimate of what the physicians believes. And then some other things that I'll leave out for now, just in the interest of time. But interestingly, so not knowing when a family meeting may have happened, at least in this study, they showed that there's a 61% had prognostic discordings, meaning more than 20% difference between what the family thinks and the physician thinks the outcome may be. And interestingly, the majority of those were optimistic. So where the family thought the outcome was better than what the physician thought. Uh, and then there was also a misunderstanding uh, in almost half. So a very interesting, intriguing paper I all uh, invite you to read. This is a paper from about uh, 12 years ago that made it to critical care paper of the year. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, it's not just what the doctor tells me, but essentially asking surrogates, this is again, gen search, not neuro, what influences your perception of prognosis? So wh why do you think the prognosis in your eyes is the way they are? And what I find intriguing is that the physician's prognostic estimate alone only matter to 2% of surrogates. Right. Well, let's put this. I, I miss said that. So only two percent of surrogates use the physician's prognostic estimate alone to come up with their own prognosis. At least about half wanted you know, used it partially. But then look at this: the majority, the highest proportion, was uh, what the patient looked like. So the patient's physical appearance, which I thought was intriguing and interesting. Right. So we all know they don't look great, um, although the nurses always put a lot of care into making sure they look decent when the family uh, comes in. And then finally, I wanted to show you this, um, what to do or what how surrogates react uh, when you use certain prognostic statements. So this is a vignette study where surrogates were asked to make an X on the line. Uh, what do you think the patient's chance of survival is when you hear the following terms? So things like, I am concerned he will not survive. So somewhat vague, it's possible he will not survive. It's probably he will not survive. I don't think he will survive. And so forth, you can, you can see it. Um, it is unlikely he will survive. This means he will likely die. Uh, but imp importantly, when there was a numeric prognostic estimate saying that there's a 5% chance of surviving, wouldn't you expect that the surrogates then make an X at five? 
Well, you can see that there was excess made around 25 in the mean uh, the mean response and with quite a variability all the way up to 40 per 40, right? And or even all the way up to up here. And then what happens when you try to use a very definite statement that closes the door, he will definitely not survive. Look how that error bar widens, meaning you know now you really uh, have uh, surrogates that have a huge optimistic bias. And so what I really like is this from this other paper is when certainty is not possible, approaches to decision-making that ignore uncertainty are viewed negatively, right? So that brings me to the next term is how do we deal with uncertainty that's always there. Uh, and um, I like this term, uncertainty is the other side of prognostication. We must embrace it and not avoid it. Uh, and also this most prognostication and critical illness is shrouded in uncertainties based on the physician's expert judgment rather than validated prediction rules. And so we have to keep that in mind that when we when we do this at the bedside is that what we do is is probably uncertain to some degree. And so how do doctors handle uncertainty? Well, they they do it in different ways. So some handle it by saying we need more data, we need better prognostic models. And while I'm certainly all for it, you know, I'm not sure machine learning is the solution to everything. It might be helpful in some, but there's also increasing data coming out that it's not any better than logistic regression because all you you what you feed the machine comes out so um, it's not totally clear how that improves things or makes more accurate predictions some doctors avoid mentioning uncertainty altogether out of the fear of creating false hope or even casting doubt on their own ability as a doctor or is thinking that they can't handle uncertainty or families can't handle uncertainty and then there's a third approach that i have a colleague that does this being completely ambiguous uh, saying we just need to wait and see, or we just need even more time, and sometimes even withdraw from the responsibility of prognostication altogether. And so um, I will show you now the uh, conglomerate of lots and lots of studies of over a decade, um, and this is all validated stuff, uh, that we should normalize the presence of uncertainty because it's unavoidable. It won't go away. Even with better models, it'll always be there that you normalize it and that you communicate it honestly and clearly, that you say it clearly, that you acknowledge it, that you avoid language that conveys, um, that you use language that conveys uncertainty. Um, so what's recommended is, you know, worst case, best case, what I think the most likely case is. And then I always say, but the gray zone in between is still there and no one will be able to give you more certainty. So normalizing that, that that's normal be compassionate and deliver with empathy, uh, but also knowing that our expert estimates are still very valuable as long as you say there is uncertainty around it and they want you to give uh, an estimate, even if it's just a rough ballpark. Uh, and that doing all of that fosters trust in the team and us as doctors. So let's move forward now. How should we do this, right? So I give you lots of stuff and I'm not sure it's any clearer now on how we should do this. Uh, as a reminder, again, there are no guidelines. There's expert opinion only. Uh, the guidelines that do exist only mention what not to do. And to me, it's also a little unclear how to train the next generation or even our own generation of clinicians on how to derive and disclose of prognostication. So this expert opinion only is the statement that came out now in 2016, um, six years ago, uh, that we should uh, do more shared decision-making in ICUs. I really like this paper. When you read it, there's a lot of great suggestions in there uh, on how to do it. It's very well written if you haven't read it. And here's a guideline on disorders of consciousness that came out in 2021, written by Joe Giacino, who's a leader in the field. But read this, right? So what they write is, when discussing prognosis with caregivers of patients with a disorder of consciousness during the first 28 days, so a whole month post-injury, clinicians must avoid statements that suggest these patients have a universally poor prognosis. So what he explained to me in, per in, in person when I asked him about this, like, no, 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 we're not trying to say don't prognosticate. We're not trying to say if you have a case that looks very serious that you couldn't say that but you can't have these generalized statements that all these patients, while well, they're still in the coma, so things must be bad. 
uh, because of the data that I've shown you. So um, let's talk about shared decision making from here on and uh, what that really is and what we've done in my lab to move forward on this. Uh, so it's really a uh, collaborative process uh, where the physician provides information on, and prognostication on treatment options using the best scientific uh, evidence, and it really is supposed to honor our expert knowledge. And then the family comes in that provides uh, information on the patient values and, and preferences, maybe the patient's baseline. And then there's a collaborative process, a joint deliberation about quality of life and some treatment options and eventually goals of care. But hopefully the family is fully informed about all care options, right? Your option, you could do this, but you could also do nothing. You could uh, give it more time. You could, uh, you know, think about which are life saving therapies. And then finally come up with the best individualized treatment decision, right? Our goal is to provide patient care concordant, uh, patient value concordant care, uh, and not just what the family wants or what the physician thinks is right. So we have, uh, again, audio recorded, I mentioned this before, audio recorded these uh, family meetings. And then there is a way that I can explain offline, but there is a way to use qualitative data to then quantify the amount of shared decision-making using this Braddox 10-point shared decision-making scale. This is validated and we do it with two investigators. Uh, and the bottom line is that only 6% of meetings contained all 10 elements of shared decision-making. So we interpret this as creating high level shared decision making. Now, it doesn't mean we don't do it at all, right? So when you look at the median score, it was seven, which isn't bad at all, right? Uh, but there's certainly uh, room for improvement. So now diving into the research I've engaged in, in the last five, six years, uh, funded through NIH, is that we do, you know, important needs assessment and we're working with stakeholders at all time points here. Uh, and developed um, a paper-based decision aid. So paper, because that was the cheapest version at the time, first in TBI, and then we adapted it to ischemic stroke uh, or large hemispheric ischemic stroke, I should say, and ICH. <clears throat> Importantly, there are quality criteria. They're called IPDAS criteria about what a, a good shared decision-making tool called the decision aid contains and our tool meets 10 out of 12 criteria. The only two criteria it doesn't meet are A, it should be web-based and available at all times and having a paper developed, uh, de developed a paper tool that wasn't the case. <clears throat> and the second one uh, that efficacy was shown. And so we haven't conducted a large multi-center phase three trial, uh, but that's what we're working towards. But we've conducted a pilot study, uh, and that's, I'm going to show you very rudimentary results of that uh, in the interest of time. I'm referring you to our paper that's now been published uh, uh, in the fall. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this is what we did. We had a convenience sample of 40 patients and their surrogates. Uh, and in a pilot study or feasibility trial, you your primary outcome is screening, ret recruitment, retention, uh, and so forth. And then you had some exploratory outcomes, some decisional outcomes. I'll show you only very few of those um, in the interest of time, but this is how we did it. So we screened surrogates um, in the first three days and enrolled them at some point. It was like a median, I think, of five or six days. Uh, but we wanted them before they started to have these goals of care discussions. We then randomized one-to-one. -one. There was an open label randomization, meaning everyone knew what the surrogate was, uh, what group they went to. Uh, and then we followed them throughout the family meeting, reminded them of the decision aid. Uh, they were supposed to fill out a worksheet and then did some other outcome assessments at several time points. Um, and, and here are our primary feasibility outcomes. It really shows, right? So we had 80% consent rate, which is pretty high, 100% in clinicians. 93% read the decision aid in full, but interestingly, not all of them received it. Why? Because we randomized a few early, but then they ended up uh, you know, um, not being eligible anymore because they either got extubated against all odds or uh, passed their swallow eval against all odds. So we had uh, some patients like that. At three months, our retention rate was 68%, which is a bit slow, lower than what you'd like to. And that has to, again, to do with the fact that some became ineligible, but also shows that these, this is a really hard group of 
uh, participants to recruit and retain because this is a tough type of situation they find themselves in and it's not easy to do research uh, on these people. So we learned a few lessons that we can deploy this in the busy ICUs, but the uh, time and timing of enrollment can be difficult and that the retention can be difficult because these are stressed uh, and grieving families. Uh, interestingly, so we asked about acceptability. You can see here the two green bars that 82% uh, thought this tool was good or excellent. And when we asked them some other acceptability questions, 96% felt that they, the tool was useful when they were making an actual decision about their family member. Um, what we also found interesting is that uh, in the intervention group, fewer people moved to withdrawal of life support. Uh, or withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. And, you know, everybody thought this tool was quite balanced. So it's not like we're trying to drive them away from that. Uh, and we're not totally sure why uh, this happened, uh, but it is an interesting finding. And so that also means that we had fewer DNI DNRs installed. And then at three months, uh, we had uh, fewer people who had died. Now, of course, their disability was still high. This is only at three months. Uh, and we weren't able to follow them up longer because of budget issues, uh, but uh, we thought that was at least an interesting finding. So moving forward in the future, we're currently uh, uh, creating uh, a new pilot trial because we've developed a web-based decision aid uh, that is very soon to launch. We're in the final kind of things that we need to do in order to launch this uh, pilot trial uh, using this time a digital decision aid. Uh, that we have um, improved with videos and uh, uh, experts in a user experience design. We've used eye tracking uh, to optimize uh, what needs to be where on the screen. So you can see here our eye tracking uh, experiments in collaboration with Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, and hopefully soon we'll launch into a trial. Our next trial will look a little different. It won't be a parallel based randomization. It'll be a what's called a step wedge cluster randomized trial, so that all sites will start in, uh, in uh, control and then at some point switch to intervention. And that is often done in behavioral intervention trials to prevent what's called bleeding into the control group where you know, people, uh, this actually happened where a provider said, I love your tool, I love what's in it, it changed the way I talk to families. And so that's all great that the person liked our tool, uh, the doctor, but we don't want that in a clinical trial, right? That you then influence the control group. And we're also thinking about what the right outcomes may be. So there's a lot of things on the horizon. We're also applying for funding. It's not always an easy uh, undertaking. Uh, and, uh, but I also leave you uh, as my final slide here, uh, what, we, what we recommend or how you could look at this. So there's a, an invited state-of-the-art review published in BMJ by us. Uh, and this is kind of how we propose uh, things should be approached, at least until we have true tools that um, are deemed uh, efficacious, so that you involve the family early and, and establish partnership and a rapport, that you at least perform 72 hours of aggressive management and actually in cardiac arrest, the newest recommendation are even longer. Uh, that you avoid this early nihilistic prognosis, which, by the way, is sometimes easier said than done because there's other consultants sometimes there that do that still. Uh, and then uh, to work towards shared decision making, right? So you uh, involve the family, you talk about uncertainty, elicit values and preferences, assess the family's understanding, discuss other things, and then provide go to care options and really inform the family of all available options. Sometimes you need more family meetings, but not always. And then the decision is made. So I'll stop here. Uh, I know we're uh, out of time, uh, but I want to also keep uh, also receive some questions from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was um, really, really a great talk. I, I know there have been some questions because I have been getting questions during your talk texted to me. So I'm wondering if anyone's brave enough to unmute themselves and ask. Well, I'd, I'd like to unmute myself and ask if that was a wonderful talk and it's a very, very, very difficult topic. But we live in a very um, diverse community and also with large, very different socioeconomic backgrounds as a patient population. So I wondered whether those 
features or factors contributed to uh, perception, understanding, explanation, etc. Whether here, you know, one of your very outstanding was the appearance of the physician, which is amazing because uh, I don't think I've ever seen that uh, noted anywhere, but clearly the appearance of physician in a diverse uh, house staff that we have, uh, the, the physician in hijab, the physician with a big beard or a turban, whether those things also uh, enter into the visual uh, communication that takes place between caretaker. Then the other question I want to ask is, uh, I didn't see that you utilize the chaplaincy or spiritual servers uh, 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 in any of the studies or deliberations. So I wonder if that's maybe a, another resource that, that I find extremely helpful, especially when I'm not familiar with the particular patient's family religions might be. And the last question is really, uh, since- Norma, I don't think she's gonna have time to answer all your questions. Yeah, I will, well, you know, I will. Length of, length of stay is a huge issue. There's so much pressure on getting patients out of the hospital. Yeah. So when there's slow recovery, how do you negotiate then uh, to keep the patients till they can get to a SNF or, or some other facility. So I know. Yeah, all Dr. Brown, all, yeah Dr. Brown, all amazing questions. And of course, you know, I only had an hour and uh, it reminds <laughs> me, it reminds me to maybe add some more. So spiritual support. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with you. And we utilize that too. I, I have a patient right now in my ICU from Ghana uh, with a highly religious family where not only do we have to um, involve the family pastor and their uh, beliefs, but also now there has to be permission from the village elder in Ghana uh, to make any decisions. And we're navigating that together with palliative care and our chaplain. We have uh, a chaplain who is from Ghana and, and, and educates us as well in their in their cultural background and why things don't go the way they normally go, right? And we have to respect that. Um, in terms of the appearance of doctors, so in the studies that I've shown you, that's not been looked at, but I know uh, certainly that uh, uh, families um, have expressed that, right? That the trust yeah. in physicians very much relates to whether the person that's talking to them and the team that's talking to them whether they look like themselves and that they're through historic right um um historic uh history matters greatly where mistrust just in general is very high when uh let's say a um you know a um family of color a patient of color is then uh talked to by a white physician uh where that absolutely matters whether there's a white physician or also a physician of color so i totally know and respect that. But some of the studies I, I've shown you, that was not looked at. Uh, and I mm. think there's certainly absolute gaps uh, in in this topic. Uh, and uh, that also, given these talks, always gives me research ideas, and that's wonderful. Um, so um, the final question, oh yeah, the length of stay. Uh, yep, we have the same thing. So I work at a safety net hospital, okay? So uh, I also have a very diverse uh, patient population. Um, now, uh, it doesn't mean that I'm proposing to keep everybody on life support for six weeks. All I'm saying is that we as physicians need to just kind of dive deep inside us and try to catch ourselves when heuristics are at play. And I, I do that all the time, like, oh, did it again. Uh, we have to be uh, mindful of that. Now, um, you know, if in doubt and if you want to give this patient more time or the family wants to give this patient more time, yeah, you should move ahead with tracheostomy and peg and move on to LTAC or whatever else the patient then goes to. Can't stay in our ICU all the time, right? So that's not what I'm proposing. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, I just gave a talk in Canada and uh, the people there came back to me and said, we have so much pressure to shorten the length of stay because of yeah. cost that they won't even fund research that could potentially decrease the withdrawal of life-sustaining support rates because it would cost the system too much money. Ugh. Isn't that interesting, right? So yeah. um, that's like the other extreme. Um, but thanks for your questions. Very, absolutely very important questions.
I defer to Dr. Gidwani, but I, I have a feeling we're about to be out of time. Um, but thank you so much for coming and speaking with us on this. And we, I, I'm sure we all look really look forward to uh, the results of your study. Thank you for having me.